This is part 10 in a series of videos in which I am going through the development of a magnetic core memory system. Uh, this series of videos is intended to promote a book I'm about to release that details this and goes into a lot of depth as to the process I went through to develop the system and um, it explains all the uh, inner workings of the system the way the array is laid out, how all the electronics works and it gives the schematics uh, that are used in the system. But the videos I wanted to make as uh, informative as I could, I can't go into too much detail uh, of course because it is uh, a fairly complex subject, but I want to try and make them as interesting as I can and hopefully um, raise the level of interest in this uh, particular subject because it is a very fascinating sphere of vintage computer systems. So in the previous video I was going through the complications that start to arise as the size of the uh, arrays grow. So as more cores get added so the uh, problems start to compound and it gets more and more difficult to actually create electronics to drive the arrays. So in this video what I'm doing is adding the sense amplifier and the inhibit driver to the arrangement that we had in the last video. So the last video I had the uh, X and Y drivers for a single X and Y wire, the pulse sequence generator and I was manually applying uh, an inhibit current to the inhibit wire. And uh, what I want to do in this video is show what the effect of the inhibit system is and the output that we actually get from the uh, sense amplifier. Before I do that, I just want to uh, respond to a very good question that came up in the previous video's comments, and that was why we need the inhibit wire at all. Um, because, as I've said several times now, when you read the array to extract the data, it actually sets the bits uh, or the cores that are selected to the zero value anyway. So why can't you just use that mechanism when you want to set a zero? Now this all comes down to the number of driver circuits that would be required if we try to use the read part of the cycle to set the zero values and we try to do away with the inhibit wire. So the reason for that is if we look at a single core then we select this core by setting currents in the X and the Y wire and then that's if we pass the current through in one direction that will erase the um, current value or effectively erase it and uh, will also allow us to figure out what the value was that had been stored in it and then we can pass current through the other way if we want to to set a one so the question really was relating to well, why did we just not pass the uh, rewrite currents through it now the reason is because we want to configure the cores in arrays and if you remember what we actually have is uh, one what are called mats so this 8x8 in our case array of cores is one mat and it's used to store one bit value in our byte and there's one of these mats for each of our bits so it was a 16 bit value for example would have 16 of them we're just storing 8 bits, so it's an 8-bit uh, system, so 8 mats. But when we select the X and the Y wire, the same X wire actually runs through the X... This is the X0 wire, runs through the X0 cores in all the mats, a single wire. And the same with the Y0 wire, it runs through all the Y0 cores in all the mats. So if we didn't have the inhibit wire, then we might be able to set all these cores to zero so if we just consider the cores that we've got uh, showing the top left hand corner here and there are of course um, 8 by 8 cores so there are 64 cores in each mat um, but if we consider just the top left hand one that's the one we're selecting if we pass current through to read the core it will of course erase all these cores to zero but if we then didn't have the inhibit wires and just pass current through the other way, um, so for example if we wanted to set just this core to a 1, we would still have to select it by setting the X and the Y currents. Uh, 
that would of course without the inhibit wires set all eight cores to a one. So the inhibit wire is used to selectively inhibit the writing of a one to whichever mat we energize the inhibit wires on. So each of these mats has its own inhibit wire. And that means that uh, we don't need to have separate drivers for the X and the Y wires on each mat. Um, and in this case, we can get away with just 16 X and Y circuits. So there'll be eight for the X and eight for the Y. And then these, this Y I've got shown here, there's obviously eight of them going through all the mats and the same with the Y. So if we did away with the inhibit wires and we went for uh, separate drivers for each of the X and Y wires in each mat, we would have to go from just 16 drivers in a system like this to 128 driver circuits. Uh, and if it was a 16 by 16 array, we'd have to go from 32 driver circuits to 256 driver circuits. Uh, so you can see it's well worth including the um, inhibit lines. Now, of course, you do need a driver for each inhibit line. So you've still got to add the same number of drivers as uh, you have bits. But even so, that's still only 24 driver circuits for this array compared to 128 if you didn't use the inhibit system. So that's why we use the inhibit wires. So what we'll do now is power this up. If that's powered up already, um, I'll switch on the signal generator and we'll apply uh, 500 nanosecond pulses to the um, sequence generator. And the way this is set up is we're going to read the single core at the end here. There are the other cores still on these wires, um, but we're only energizing or selecting the one on the right. You probably can't see it, but there's just a single core there that we'll be selecting. The other cores are there just to load up the system as it would be in the final array. And uh, as I say, we'll read the core by passing current through it in one direction. There's then a slight delay of half a microsecond. And then we uh, effectively write a one back to the core. We have to do that, otherwise we'd only see a single pulse and then it would stop uh, responding. And we now have hooked up the sense amplifier to the inhibit sense line and also the inhibit driver to the same line so it's now fulfilling both functions and we'll have a look at the signal that's coming out of the uh, sense amplifier so I'll turn on the signal generator so what we're looking at now is the green trace is the input from the signal generator that's the start of cycle pulse and it's uh, as I say 500 nanoseconds the scope is set to 500 nanoseconds per division the yellow trace is what's coming out of the sense line. I'll turn down the gain on the scope of that channel and you can see that we have this huge pulse at the beginning and as I explained in the previous video that is caused by the uh, direct coupling between the um, X and Y wires and the inhibit wire because there are of course 16 common um, cores connecting those two lines together. But that's not the, the signal we're interested in. The one we're interested in is the one that's kind of hidden away. I'll turn the game back up. And is not currently present because we're applying an inhibit pulse. So what's happening here is that the inhibit pulse is passing current through the inhibit line in the opposite direction to the X wire. So although we are selecting the X and the Y wire with sufficient current to cause this core to change state, it's not changing state because we're also at the same time applying the inhibit current in the opposite direction to the inhibit wire. If I take this jumper out, it will turn the inhibit off and then we'll see the signal output rise here when the uh, value in the core is set to a 1 and then we read that back. So you can now see that level has risen. So this little hump here is the one we're interested in. And 
this is the output from the sense line uh, this portion of the trace the function of this wire is to sense the signal and then we've got this other pulse down here so the one that's negative going on which is actually the core value being written back to a one we can prove that it's this core that's doing that we've got a magnetic tipped screwdriver and if i put it next to any core there'll be a bit of distortion but it doesn't really do anything when i get to the core that we are actually energizing you can see that's both signals disappear both the read back signal and the write signal disappear so we can be sure that it's that particular core that we are energizing so once we set the uh, core to a one we read it back we get this hump and that's detected by the sense amplifier and this blue trace is the squared up output from the sense amplifier the cursor line we have here is effectively the point at which the pulse generator circuit is used to sample the output so if the output at this point where this dotted vertical yellow line is if the output on the blue trace is high at that point that will give us a one if it's low at that point it will read back a zero because that signal is used to uh, latch this value into the read latch so if i put the jumper back to re-enable the inhibit line notice now that we're getting a low at this point if i toggle between on and off you'll see that as I inhibit and remove the inhibit, then the signal changes from a zero, where it is now, to a one. And you can hopefully tell now in the rest of this signal what's going on. We've got this big pulse here, which is the inhibit line. Or it's the output from the sense line when it's been used as inhibits, it's a big uh, spike. And when I remove the inhibit function, disable it, that disappears and we write a one back to the core and then when we read it we get that uh, showing up if we look at the raw output from the sense amplifier we can see that's just a, a spike that's responding to the large current pulse the blue trace is set to one volt per division so it's uh, sorry two volts per division so it's quite a big signal we're looking at there and again if I disable the inhibit then you can see we're getting this secondary spike and that's the one that we are squaring up and using to detect our output if we go back to the squared up output again reading a zero disable inhibit we're reading a one and so that's what we're effectively doing we're detecting this very small signal at this point it's only about 30 or 40 milli volts and we've got this nearly one volt signal right next to it where we have to discriminate it from so um, that's why the circuit is quite tricky to design but as you can see it's working in a quite a stable way what made this circuit quite difficult to design was the need to operate over a very wide range of um, refresh frequencies we're currently reading at 2000 cycles per second so if i change the time based on the scope to 200 microseconds per division you can see that we are reading very infrequently i also had to optimize this circuit to keep the average current drawn under control we're talking here about switching very fast signals into inductive loads so we need to make sure that it was very efficient uh, otherwise we'd end up drawing five or six amps uh, if we were writing a zero to all the cores and that would be too much for the system to be able to handle so at the moment at two kilohertz it's drawing 44 milliamps this is the entire system and if i increase the uh, read rate from two kilohertz up to 50 kilohertz change the time base so we're now at 10 microseconds per division and the average current drawn is now 150 um, milliamps so you can see that the current drawn really does go up but bear in mind we are applying an inhibit pulse every time here so if i remove the inhibit function that current drops to 130 milliamps so um, 
what I was aiming for is an average of less than one and a half amps and we only ever energize one X and one Y wire at the same time uh, but we can energize of course up to eight inhibit wires if we're writing a value of all zeros to the memory. If we go up to 100 kilohertz refresh Okay, we're now looking at uh, 250 milliamps. If I again disable refresh, then it drops to 230 milliamps. So well within target there, we should be well under one and a half amps, so it will work fine. Um, but also, of course, we need it to continue to work. So we need this signal to be to the left of the dotted line when inhibit is on and to the right when inhibit is off. And as you can see, that's working just fine, even if we change the frequency from 2 kilohertz up to 100. It will work up to 200 kilohertz. Um, beyond that, we start running out of a uh, cycle time. Um, the cycle actually ends here. What these spikes are, if we look at the output from the sense amplifier, we've got this big spike here. This is actually caused by the additional cores that we aren't currently using and that we aren't changing state. The reason there's this spike is because as we increase the current through the wires passing through all these cores, bear in mind there are 64 cores on this uh, set of wires, even the ones that don't change state still build up a flux because there's a current uh, in the wire passing through them, even if only one wire has a current going through it it still causes a flux to build up even if that current in the wire is below the critical level that will cause the core to flip it will still generate a flux in that core and then when we turn the current off after a short delay the flux collapses in that core or all the cores together and then we get this uh, voltage being induced in the uh, sense wire uh, and of course that's uh, just because the rapidly changing flux is um, the same thing as having a couple of, a couple of windings on a transformer and it's the same effect. So that's um, how the system works. It's just a amplifier that is set up in a fairly careful manner. It's not particularly critical but it is um, carefully designed to give us the signal out range that we want. Go back to the squared up output and we can see that um, it's working in an extremely stable manner. It's, although it looks like a very messy signal on the inhibit wire, it's because there's a lot going on. It's switching between inhibit and, and sense, and so it uh, looks like a messy signal. But if you look at each particular section, it's doing very specific things at those times. So that's how the system works. and. It's just really scaling this up and um, duplicating these circuits several times on the main board. And there's, uh, of course there's one set of these uh, circuits for each of the wires on the main board. And then we have all the timing and latches and whatever else to uh, allow the system to operate as a complete memory system. So that's why we need an inhibit wire. This is how we're driving it and this is how we're sensing the output when the inhibit wire is used as the sense output. Okay, well I hope a lot made sense. Um, any questions please leave a comment and in the next video we'll look at the uh, main board again. Um, this is probably as far as you can go with breadboarding this. It's very difficult doing this on a, on a breadboard because of the um, high currents and, and wires uh, that are really too long for this to work as it should but even so it does seem to be reasonably stable um, but I can't really add much more to this without going to an actual uh, PCB. So the next video we'll get the PCB back on the bench, get that powered up and then start looking at that in more detail and see how the signals on that compare to the signals we're looking at here from the breadboards.